Well, good morning to G the GCI family here in India and uh, special uh, greetings to Mrs. Noah. Finally, she has come out of hiding. Very happy to see her on uh, joining us and thank you all for joining us. Welcome to our uh, online services. I must say that I really appreciate uh, when I see the young people participating you know, in worship services, uh, giving us and providing us uh, a unique perspective that they bring to worship. So uh, it was lovely to hear Anna sing the special song. And of course, <clears throat> uh, Roshan reading scripture. And we have, uh, you know, seen uh, Jessica and uh, Josephine and Hasini and all of them participating. It was also nice to see today as we started worship, uh, the chairmanship was also done as a team. You had Sam and Manoa together leading us in the chairmanship. <laughs> so uh, it is lovely that Sam is participating in our worship. But thank you again uh, and keep it up. It's lovely to see uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the participation of the young people. And I believe that is a sign of a healthy church when everybody are involved in providing a service and, of course, joining together in worship. As we uh, today move into the main message, uh, uh, the recent Sundays and Wednesdays, uh, if you have been attending uh, our discussions, our messages on these days, have been centered around faith, our faith, uh, and how we journey in that faith, the belief that we repose in Jesus Christ our Lord, and the journey that we take. You have uh, hopefully attended all the uh, sessions of the stages of growth in our faith that uh, Sachin Nirale brought for us, helping us to see how we const constantly are on this journey growing in our faith. Even in our Bible studies, recently we discussed the importance of manifesting our faith. That real faith is not just a passive belief, but an active living it out in our daily lives. Our belief doesn't just stay in our heads and our minds, but it translates into our lifestyle, our actions, and what we do, you know, every single moment of uh, our lives. And that hopefully can, you know, we, we would be reminded of what James reminded us, that faith without works is dead. And so, uh, Today, I want to continue that discussion on our faith. Uh, and I want to bring out an important aspect of our faith, how we live out our faith, how we live out our belief. Uh, and as you may have already uh, guessed by reading the, you know, by listening to the scripture reading, that today, we are seeing that the way we, or the one important aspect of our faith is to make every effort to walk in the unity of the spirit. And that's what the apostle Paul was trying to help us understand as he writes uh, in the book of Ephesians chapter four, making sure there was unity in the church that we are making every effort which is the title of the sermon today, making every effort or endeavor of it to uh, the unity of the spirit and to maintain that unity in the spirit. So we're going to do a short study in the scripture reading that was done in Ephesians 4. But as we move into that, I remember this uh, reading a story about a mother and a son recently in America. And... Uh, it's a, it's a tragic story of how the son told her mother that he would never speak to her again because 
of the presidential candidate for whom she voted. The son was upset that she would vote for someone that he did not endorse. And I, you know, and it's, and it's interesting to notice that a political ideology would interrupt such an important relationship between a mother and a son. You know? In other words, uh, this son was willing to fracture his relationship with his son for the sake of a political ideology. For him, his affiliation to politics was more important than a mother-son relationship. And so, you know, that probably helps us to see that something is terribly wrong in our societies today, isn't it? Uh, it has become divided beyond recognition. We live in a society where there is no value given to a sense of unity, to a, you know, there is no sanctity to relationships. And we are quick to, you know, fracture relationships, divide, and to break relationships for sometimes reasons that are, you know, so silly. We have, our society has given more value to individualism rather than a collective communal societal situation, you know, reality that we need to recognize. And unfortunately, you know, even in our churches, in our religious institutions, we begin to see the ugly uh, spectacle of disunity, of, you know, people willing to break and fracture the unity. You may have heard me say this before, but I still remember that sad story of a church uh, that split over the use of a particular hymn book. I mean, can you imagine that a church would be willing to split and divide just because one faction didn't want to use a particular hymn book? These are the silly reasons that people are so willing and so ready to fracture and break relationships, right? So the Apostle Paul comes in and reminds us as he writes to the Ephesian church that there is something very important, the way we maintain our faith, the way we live our faith, that it has to be done with a sense of unity within and amongst ourselves. And so I want to bring you the context of what he is writing, the apostle to the Ephesians. But as we do that, let me just once again, read through that scripture and uh, you can then uh, try to focus on what the apostle is trying to say uh, as he helps us understand the context. If you see on the screen, my title is Making Every Effort. I hope uh, it is big enough for you to see. I might just make it just a little bigger. And in Ephesians 4, uh, beginning in verse 1, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Powerful words that mirror the essential, essentialness of a sense of unity. Now, what is the, what is the uh, context in which the apostle is writing this? Uh, he probably noticed that there were some divisions in the church in Ephesus. In the church in Ephesus, 
the church had Jews, you know, from a, a Christians from a Jewish background, from a non-Jewish background, you know, from a Gentile background. And perhaps these Christians were finding it hard uh, to figuring out how to live in peace with people from different backgrounds. How do you accommodate the differences that exist and the, and the diversities that people bring from their backgrounds? Can we accommodate all of that? And so the Apostle Paul is encouraging them in the faith that while we live out our faith, we have to remain united no matter what background we all may come from. The body of Christ must show a sense of unity. You see, because the church will have diverse people, people from diverse races or ethnic backgrounds or nationalities, right? Uh, or also, uh, you know, uh, the, the choice of cuisine. You may be vegetarian, non-vegetarian, vegan. Now I have lost count of how many choices that there are in the cuisines that we see today, right? Some people are gluten-free and some are not. Uh, but Paul is saying, embrace the diversity and maintain unity. Embrace the diversity and maintain unity. And so let's just quickly go through the study. And I want to pick up some very important aspects which we may or may not have seen before uh, you know, in these scriptures. Notice in verse one, okay? Uh, let me put that up on the screen. Verse one, it says, I therefore, a prisoner of the law, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, right? Notice that, uh, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, all right? Uh, what is this worthy of our calling? Why does he say you must walk worthy of our calling? What is he referring to? And many a times we may think only of probably a moral standard that we follow. Uh, we may think that walking worthy of a calling is to be scrupulously obedient, to be sinless perhaps, or to follow some sense of moral perfection. Now that may be included, that you can, you may include that and that is necessary, uh, you know, while we live out our calling, but the context actually suggests something else. The context is saying, your, you walk worthy of your calling in the way you live in the community of the church. In other words, the context is relational, not necessarily moral purity. He is bringing in the aspect of relational, our relationship with one another. You know? In other words, are we involved in church? Do we participate in the body of Christ? Is our Christianity just individualistic or does it involve you know, others? Are we involving ourselves in the community of the church and the life of the church? Or are we just being standalone Christians? So walking worthy of our calling is to be involved in church life, participating in everything that we do in church, not just being saying, oh, I am happy with you know, my relationship with Jesus. I'm happy, I don't need anybody else. No, that is not what, how we live out our faith. And that is not walking worthy of our calling. Walking worthy of our calling means that we embrace one another, how we treat one another, in the church, embracing Christ means embracing one another. It is relational. That's something that we cannot afford to ignore as we live out our faith. You know, uh, and we have to be careful that we don't become so focused on a sense of moral purity, even though that is important, and we completely ignore 
that relational aspect of our lives. Recently, just as, as I always do, gets these WhatsApp, you know, posts, forwards and videos and all that stuff. And there was this recent post that I got, which was, you know, once again, uh, harping on, uh, you know, obedience, you know, scrupulous obedience and particularly to the Ten Commandments and in more particular to the Sabbath command, which was something which we had done, you know, for many, many years prior to our Reformation because we gave so much importance to the Sabbath. And the post went down to say that if you don't keep the Sabbath, you're not a Christian. That you will be judged. Right? Uh, and I was, I mean, I appreciate the diligence that some people put, you know, to the, to the uh, Ten Commandments. Wonderful if you can do it and keep it. But there was not a word about how you treat one another. The post had all dire warnings that if you don't keep the Sabbath, this is, you know, going to, you will, you will be punished in this manner and that manner. But what about the way you treat one another? Why wasn't there no mention of that? You see, that is the unfortunate thing. And it can't help me uh, uh, just read to you what the Apostle John writes. 1 John chapter 4. Uh, notice what he says. And especially in terms of how we live out the faith. Is it just keeping the Sabbath? Well, look at what he says. 1 John chapter 4 verse 20. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Very strong words. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Verse 21 goes on to say, and he has given us this command. This is the command which is not being mentioned in all these posts. Anyone who loves God must also love their brothers and sisters. So, brethren, how do we treat one another? That's how we have to recognize being worthy of our calling, walking worthy of our calling. Let's not forget that. And what does verse 2 say? Let me just uh, uh, help you see verse 2. In verse 2, it says, how, how is it that we must uh, walk uh, with one another? How should we treat one another? Verse 2 says, with all humility and gentleness and uh, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Right? With all humility, uh, you know, with gentleness and patience. Right? Our calling is to live with humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. In other words, our calling is directly related to our relationship with others. And the question is, why is this important? Why is Paul so insistent on talking about the relational dimension of our Christianity and of our faith? Because we need to recognize that we are called into a body. We are not called into a vacuum. We are not called into some, some sense of, you know, moral purity, just, just moral purity. We are called into a body, and it is the body of Christ. You see, in other words, what he's trying to say is, you and I are not called to a standalone relationship with Christ. Our relationship to Christ involves other people. The great command that we many a times refer to does not stop just loving God but loving our neighbor also. In fact, the new command which Jesus gave in John 13, the gospel of John 13, he says the new command is to love one another as I have loved you. He doesn't even talk about loving God. Did you, want, did you, you, know, did you ever wonder why? Jesus says, I give you a new command. 
love one another as I have loved you. He doesn't say, love God. Have you ever wondered why? Because when you love one another, that proves you love God. That is the faith and the walk that we must walk and the worthiness that we must retain in our walk. And so, brother, our relationship with God is not separate from our relationship with other people. You cannot separate our relationship with God, you know, and completely divorce everybody else out of it. No, you cannot. Our relationship with God is demonstrated, actually, tested and proved by how we care for our fellow human beings. And so, as we reflect on that, what must this lead to? The Apostle Paul tells us what it must lead to. All right, let's read uh, verse 3 uh, in the reading. Verse 3 says, eager or making every effort, that's the title of my sermon today, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. All right, that's what the Apostle Paul is telling us. In other words, the church will always be one in the spirit. And what is Paul saying? We are, he's encouraging us to accept that oneness that we have in the spirit and live into that hope. That is our calling. Our calling is to live into that sense of unity made possible in the spirit. In other words, don't allow the church to become you know, split and make it two and three and four and, you know, millions as it is today, unfortunately. But now let me ask you this very important question as we reflect on it. Why are we being called into this oneness? Why is it that the apostle is telling us, uh, maintain the unity of the spirit? Because we cannot become Oh, sorry, uh, uh, in other words, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Let me just catch that up there. So we go back to the sense of unity. If we, uh, uh, he's asking us not to break the unity in the spirit. And what is important for us to understand is, you and I are not creating that unity. That's a very important for us to understand. Even as we maintain, the, we are called to maintain the unity, not create it. Where is the unity created? The unity is created by Christ in the spirit. You see, and all we are being told is to live into that unity. Our job is to accept that unity and live into it. We don't create the unity. In other words, that unity already exists in Christ, I mean, with, uh, through Christ and in the spirit. So if we don't live into that spirit and if we break the, the unity, it is not, we are not breaking the unity of, the, of, of Christ in the spirit and the church in, in, in that sense. It is, we are breaking ourselves. If we don't live into that unity, what we are actually doing is we are breaking ourselves. We are not breaking the church. That's a powerful thing. Once again, perhaps a very serious thing to think about. Right? So walking worthy of our calling is to live into a unity that already exists. It is like, for example, you know, to make sure that we accept Jesus Christ as law. You don't make him law. You see, Christ is already law. The question is, do you accept that? Do you live into the lordship of Christ? You and I cannot make him law because Christ is already crowned the law. Right? Uh, the choice for us is if we are going into uh, accept him as the Lord and make him the Lord of our lives because his lordship is under no dispute. Similarly, unity is already there through Christ in the spirit. The question is, are we going to live into it? Or if we don't, 
Are we going to break the unit? Are we going to break ourselves with regards to the sense of unity? Right? So the apostle then goes on to say in verse four, he says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. In other words, the church will always be one in the spirit. And like I said earlier, we are being encouraged to accept that oneness and live into that hope, right? Uh, we are being called into that oneness. Why? Because we cannot become who we are supposed to become without this sense of oneness. In other words, we need each other. We need a sense of community. We cannot become our, reach our potential just by ourselves. We need one another. We need the encouragement of others. We need the correction of one another. We need the communion of one another. Only then we are able to become who we, you know, who are uh, the real potential that we have. Otherwise, if we break this unity and live apart from the sense of unity, we are actually being the children, I mean, it's the children of the devil. We are, we are supposed to be the children of God, but we become the children of the devil. Let me read you one scripture uh, uh, in, uh, this is in uh, 1 John chapter 3. I'll read you this, it's not on the screen. In verse 10, it says, this is how we know who, who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Notice the difference. Children of God, children of devil. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Notice that? Anyone who does not love their brother or sister throws us into the category of becoming children of the devil. That's how serious the sense of unity is. That is how serious living into the sense of unity is for us as those who belong to the faith, the faith that we have been called into by Jesus Christ our Lord, All right? And finally, let's look at those last two verses, verse five and verse six. And notice it says, verse five says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, verse six, one God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. All right, uh, very interesting choice of words there. Oneness is written all over. In other words, we are worshiping a God who is one who promotes oneness, unity, peace, love. We don't worship a God who promotes strife, division, hatred. So brethren, if you want to live worthy of our calling, we must be devoted to the unity in the spirit. Right? We must pursue this oneness and unity in the church. And uh, this reminds me of uh, a professor that I knew when I was attending Ambassador College many, many years back. Uh, his name, some of you might uh, recognize the name Dr. Stavrinides. You know, Dr. Stavrinides had a double PhD. He was a brilliant person. He was of Greek origin and he was a professor in our college. Uh, teaching uh, various important subjects. And uh, we came to know about one aspect about his life. You know, being the scholar that he was, and of course, the tremendous amount of study he had done in the scriptures, he was able to see some of our doctrinal errors quite early, you know, long before the Reformation took place. And I, and I remember him telling that he had gone to the founder and the president at that time, Herbert W. Armstrong, and he had told Herbert Armstrong that some of our doctrinal positions were not, uh, you know, not biblical. But for some reason, Herbert Armstrong couldn't see that at that particular point in time. And he told Dr. Stavridis, sorry, but uh, no, I cannot change. This is the doctrine. We will follow this, even though Dr. Stavridis was able to see clearly from scripture 
some of the things like the Trinity and some of the things like born again, some, uh, some, the way we taught it was wrong. But what, here is what is interesting about a man such as Dr. Stavridis. He saw the importance of the unity that should be maintained in the church, that he did not pursue that. He could see Ms. Armstrong couldn't understand that. He maintained the unity. He did not leave the church. He privately understood what he understood. Till one day, the church itself led to a reformation. And did you know that Dr. Stavnidis was one of those who led us into the Trinitarian uh, you know, uh, perspective? Because he was extremely good at being able to understand the subject. And I still remember attending something like a 12 series lecture of his uh, explaining how God is triune. But what is commendable about this man is he did not break the unity of the church in spite of the fact that leaders of the church couldn't understand. Brethren, pursuing unity is hard work. You know, it is easier to divide. It's easier to go about our own business than it is to maintain unity. It's hard work to maintain unity. It's hard work to be concerned about one another and accept the differences of one another. To be patient, to be humble, to be gentle, to show love. It's not easy. And so, brethren, let us not fall into the temptation to take the easy way out. Let us make every effort, like the Apostle Paul says, to live worthy of our calling, specifically to maintain and pursue the bonds of peace with one another and maintain the unity in the spirit. I like this uh, very interesting quotation. Let me just share it with you. This is from a Greek Orthodox priest this particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, quotation. And uh, the quotation says, unity is the quintessence of Christianity. The word quintessence basically means the essence of a thing in its purest and most concentrated form. So he uses a very interesting word. Unity is the quintessence of Christianity. Christ called everyone to be in unity and he gave us the example to be united just as, he's, as he is united in the Father and to the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when we talk about Christianity, we must talk about unity. This is by Bishop Ignatius uh, from Greece of the Greek Orthodox Church. And notice the Trinitarian focus there, right? The very essence of Christianity is unity. Why? Because it all comes from our triune God. And that is why we constantly focus on a Trinitarian perspective in our church, the Trinitarian perspective. Let's not forget, unity is the quintessence of Christianity. And so in closing, brethren, let me just uh, give you some uh, you know, quick applications of uh, the ways to promote unity, right? Number one, make every effort to understand that a relationship with Christ is also a relationship with others. Don't fall into the temptation to think that if you have a relationship with Christ, that you don't need to have good relationship with others. Our relationship with Christ must reflect our relationship with others. Second point, make every effort to pray for the church, the corporate church, because you need to learn to think beyond yourself, not just for yourself. Point number three, make every effort to be conscious of the needs of others and, of course, fulfill them if you're able. That once again shows that you are interested in a sense of community. You are conscious of the, you know, of others, not just yourself. And uh, the, the fourth point, make every effort to pray for those who you may have differences with. And especially pray to allow for diversity without breaking unity. Ask God to help you maintain that sense of unity. 
And finally, uh, we are a family. Let's not forget that. Let's be united like a family. Though each member in the family may be different, right? And to bring this home more closely, let me play you a video after which we will uh, end the sermon. So if I can request Praveen to play this video at this time. My wife and I have three children, two daughters and one son. If you have children and if you're like me, you have probably said something like this to your spouse. I don't know where she gets that trait. It must be from you. You may have noticed that one child has great athletic ability and another one hates all types of sports. One child likes to read and avoid crowds and the other could care less about books but enjoys a good party and you think how could these children have the same parents the same upbringing yet be so different the diversity within a family is a small example of the di diversity you find in the church and the way you navigate these differences is very much the same the book of first corinthians tells us about a church that was diverse greeks Romans and Asians lived in Corinth, and some say this diversity contributed to a factious or contentious spirit which carried over to the church in Corinth. The Apostle Paul addresses these issues and appeals to the church for everyone to get along. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. Apparently, there had been some disagreements in the church over whose baptism was better, Paul's or Apollo's. This disagreement sounds very much like how people today talk about their favorite sports teams, but Paul cuts through the particulars of their argument with the bottom line, be united in mind and purpose. That's how we handle diversity within our families. We agree on certain absolutes and family values like respect and honor. Our family's purpose is to show this respect and honor by making allowances for our differences. For example, I love the beach. And on our family vacations, I could spend every single day at the beach. But when we go on vacation, we don't spend every day at the beach. Instead, we try to include activities that are important to each person in our family. We honor our differences. Everyone has a good time and the family is unified. Likewise, in the church, we hold certain truths as absolute, such as God's great love for every human being, Yet we can agree to disagree about minor points and opinions that are often shaped by our experiences and our history. We don't browbeat people into feeling they have to change their opinions to be loved and accepted. We see the church as a family and we focus on our unity in Christ. Even Jesus himself did not try to change the opinions of those he encountered. He showed respect for all, setting the example that being human makes every person valuable and worthy of love. The Corinthian church shows us that unity doesn't need uniformity. May you grow in your ability to love and accept people where they're at, communicating each person's intrinsic value. Mi nombre es Ever Ticas, Hablando de Vida.